Welcome to the latest Insights um, Revisited Lecture, Seeing Homosexuality in Joe Orton's What the Butler Saw, which was given by Dr Emma Parker and Joe Orton's sister, um, Leonie Orton, um, in February 2019. This was a lecture that was given as the then um, LGBT plus History Month. And as an event, it really, for me, seemed to capture and consolidate an ambition that I'd had for a long, long time um, to bring um, probably the foremost scholar of Orton in the UK to Newcastle, um, but also his sister, Leonie, who has written extensively on Joe, but also had an incredibly personal and interesting relationship with her brother up until his death at the hands of his lover, Kenneth Halliwell, in 1967. Um, I've been obsessed with Joe Orton from about the age of 14 and as a young gay man growing up in the north of England, Orton's plays and his life actually, particularly through his diaries and representations of Orton in film and television documentaries were an absolute lifeline to me. Um, the subversive, resistant, funny, sometimes shocking and controversial um, farcical jokes and language which became and have become known as Orton-esque humour again became part of my kind of language and vocabulary as a teenager and certainly informed my own writing and often my own kind of take on things and particularly on, on queer life and its responses to often quite challenging times. Um, I think this lecture is particularly interesting um, and insightful and relevant right now, um, not just in the midst of, of COVID-19, but also in the midst of the recent events around um, Black Lives Matter and um, the death of, of George Floyd. Um, Orton was notorious and even though he's not living now, um, I think his, his notoriety and his response to these often discriminatory, oppressive and incredibly violent acts was often summed up in a lot of his plays. And the plays often looked at the absurdity of things like discrimination and regulation and systemic or systematic um, oppression and bias and mocked them and made them into things which were sometimes uncomfortable to look at but also they highlighted just the ways in which often really really resistant and oppressive acts can also be viewed as things which drive us towards um, social and cultural change. Um, I hope you enjoy the lecture and Joe Orton forever. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, thanks Martin. And, and thanks as well to the Insights, um, the, the Insights lecture series, the Insights lecture series rather, which I think, you know, annually has created, this is the third year we've done this, um, a platform for visibility and awareness around LGBTQ plus history and particularly my own work within the university that um, I lead a, a seminar series called the Queer Media Culture um, Seminar Series, which kind of works with um, researchers and groups of people within the university who, I guess, kind of um, belong under that huge umbrella of um, LGBTQ+. Um, and it also reaches out the seminar series to um, other organisations and um, platforms within, within the North East, and particularly within Newcastle. Um, current projects I'm working on, there was an event last night at the Tide Tide Cinema, um, we have a regular queer cinema club and queer cinema programme there and also um, working on really exciting projects with Globe Gallery um, in, in Newcastle. So it, it really is a, a fantastically kind of energetic and interesting time, not just in terms of LGBT um, research, but also history and, and visibility, I think. I also wanted to use this just to kind of say that the university itself has made huge kinds of um, advances, I think, since we first started these LGBT um, history lectures two years ago and the first lecture which was badged as that was, was with Peter Tatchell and um, I'm just kind of privileged and, and able to say that as the chair of a staff LGBT network which now exists at Newcastle called Rainbow at NCL um, there is a, a really kind of vibrant and I think very relevant equality diversity and inclusion drive um, throughout the university and that's not just for LGBT it's for lots of other kind of minoritised groups and identities so I just wanted to kind of say that and to, to thank Martin again for allowing the Insights Lecture to, to really front face and to be able to, to convey that really. Um, back to this evening and this evening's event, um, which I think is incredibly relevant, both on a, 
a personal level to me, but also a political and a cultural level, particularly in and around the identity um, of Joe Orton, and particularly his legacy um, in and around LGBT, and um, I use this term very deliberately, um, queer histories of um, representation and creativity. Um, most of you, all of you, I guess, um, will know the work of Orton, and I think tonight, particularly um, with Emma's first part of the lecture, which I'll talk about in a second, and then Lainey, who is Jordan's sister. Um, particularly what came out last night at the Timeside event was the tensions, for want of a better term, and the contrasts between Joe Orton, the public figure, and Joe Orton, the private <coughs> man, and the ways in which that is kind of driven to or articulated through his homosexuality, um, the famous diaries, but also the plays and um, subsequently the representations which have um, happened after his death. So particularly, um, Orton will have been dead now for 52 years in the summer, um, in, in August 2019, that will be 52 years, yes. Um, and the representations, what I'm trying to say, the films, the documentaries, the interpretations and the adaptations of his life. And I think that's something both Emma and Lainey will, will address. So without further ado, um, Emma is going to take the floor for the first 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, and her lecture, which is on the, the short handout that you have, is um, Seeing Homosexuality in Jordan's um, What the Butler Saw. Um, I'll let Emma kind of explore those, those, um, those issues within her, her, her talk. But um, really, she's badged it as something, i.e. the talk, that explores how Orton's black comedy, or queer black comedy, and subverts sexual double standards and mocks heteronormativity and challenges discourses of deviance, which I think is an incredibly pertinent thing to think about, particularly in relation to contemporary LGBT and queer identity. This will then be followed by Lainey, who's going to talk about her brother, um, and we'll read from her memoir, um, I Had It In Me. She has titled her part of the discussion, um, I'm From The Gutter, um, which again, I think if you're an author fan, You'll, you'll kind of recognise that reference and understand, um, particularly when they only speaks um, as to what she's getting at. More so, um, Lainey's going to explore the, the kind of frames of Orton's life which exist beyond, I think, the 1960s. We were talking about this last night and we said um, Orton's celebrity and fame is consolidated into an incredibly short time frame, you know, four or five years max maybe, particularly in terms of his identity as a, a queer public figure and a kind of go-to figure in the 1960s. And I know Leon is going to explore the origins of her brother's outrageous humour, particularly in Leicester and through the Orton family, um, before he was famous, for want of a better way of articulating it. Um, and really, only wonderful people, and I just want to thank them as well um, for their time here and the wonderful work <coughs> that they're both doing um, tirelessly, actually, to share and to retain um, Jordan's legacy. And um, I'm sure that's something as well we can explore in the, in the talks. Um, one final thing, Mark asked me to do this. Um, is just to plug really um, the fantastic opportunity um, that we have. Blackwells are here and there's a, a stall in the, the lobby area with a number of Jordan's works, the diaries, John Law's biography and the plays, but also um, Lainey's fantastic, it really is a fantastic piece of writing. Um, I had it in there and she will be signing copies um, of the book after the lecture um, this evening. So I'll shut up and I'll hand straight over to the wonderful Emma Parker. Um, and I look forward to chairing the discussion after we've heard from both of them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gareth, um, for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you also for the invitation to come speak at the University of Newcastle. It's a privilege to be here in this wonderful city and your beautiful university. And um, thank you to Martin for the invitation to contribute to the Insights uh, lecture series. Can everybody, can you hear me in the back? Can I just check? Okay. Um, so, I'm talking about what the Butler saw today because um, 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the play. So this seems a particularly apposite moment to, to go back to the play, to reread it and to think about it a bit more. Unlike his previous plays, um, Entertaining Mr. Sloan and um, Loot, Sloan 64, Loot 66, <coughs> What the Butler Saw, first performed in 1969, features no same-sex desire between men. There are a couple of allusions to homosexual acts, 
Um, for example, Nicholas Beckett, the page boy at the Station Hotel, says he was once the slave of a corporal in the Welsh Fusiliers. And previously, Nick says, he encountered men who would mess with him for money. Dr. Prentice's knowledge of the pay that Nick has received, five shillings, the gracious, the rate hasn't changed in 30 years, suggests that he perhaps also once sold sex to men. But neither Nick nor Prentice desire men in the present moment of the play. Indeed, they both aggressively pursue uh, women. Uh, Prentice even states, um, Um, I'm a heterosexual, and there's Rufus Hound um, looking very heterosexual in the 2017 production at Curve Theatre in Leicester. The Duper Entendre, in his wife's suggestion that he employ a male secretary, try a boy for a change, <coughs> apparently confirms his claim to be heterosexual while simultaneously suggesting other possibilities. Despite the lack of same-sex desire, I want to propose that homosexuality is the absent centre of Orton's queer black comedy. And <coughs> queer in this context is not simply a synonym for homosexual, but denotes, um, as David Halperin says, whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. So that's the definition of queer I'm using. The queerness of Orton's play, I want to argue, lies in the challenge to discourses of deviance, particularly medical definitions of homosexuality as sickness, and the social equation of homosexuality with rape. It's subversion of sexual stereotypes and its critique of heteronormativity. So those are the things I want to look at. One way that Orton flags the queerness of his play is through intertextuality. Um, Specifically, through parallels with Oscar Wilde's importance of being earnest. Orton shares, with, shares Wilde's epigrammatic wit and steals elements of his plot. And like Wilde, his play is full of homosexual subtext. But Orton uses intertextuality to simultaneously situate himself in a homosexual literary tradition and to invoke the social and sexual conventions that he's targeting for attack. His title suggests a saucy sex comedy through allusion to the what the butler saw machines that permit a viewer to furtively watch a woman undress, like a butler peering through the keyhole of a bedroom door. The title then suggests voyeurism, invokes the figure of the peeping Tom, and introduces more specifically the purpose of my lecture, the theme of looking or seeing importance of that. At the same time, the title implies a working class view of the upper class. As a working class queer, Orton's outsider perspective is evident in the play from the way he spoofs mainstream sex comedies, very popular in the period, <coughs> and epitomised by um, uh, the Whitehall farce and also films such as Carry On Nurse, 1959, and Carry On Doctor, 1967. Though what the butler saw is often performed as a sex comedy, it's not a sex comedy, it's a satire on sex comedy. So it's a play that subverts the norms that are upheld in films like these. Set in a psychiatric hospital, in a clinic, one of the norms unsettled by the play is the idea that homosexuality is a sickness in need of a cure. Sigmund Freud understood all infants to be inherently bisexual, but imbued expressions of same-sex desire as a phase in psychosexual development and attributed homosexuality to an unresolved Oedipus complex, or what he called arrested development. So he regarded homosexuality as, quote, an aberration from normal sexuality. By the mid-20th century, this Freudian view was widespread. It was incredibly popular. It was almost everybody's understanding of how somebody came to be homosexual. In 1952, homosexuality was included in the American Psychiatric Association's first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, and Irving Bieber's 
very influential book called Homosexuality, a Psychoanalytic Study of Male Homosexuals, published 10 years later in 62. Um, that was a book that advocated uh, conversion therapy from a psychoanalytic perspective. Um, other treatments included aversion therapy, feeding men drugs that would make them feel sick um, or when they looked at pictures of men, or administering electric shocks. Chemical castration, in other words, feeding men male female hormones, which often change them physically. Um, even lobotomy. Um, as this magazine article <coughs> shows, um, <coughs> homosexuals can be cured, psych psychologists and psychiatrists claim. This was published in 1957 in a magazine called Confidential. Um, as this illustrates, psychoanalysis proposes that homosexuality was a mental illness that could be cured. Joe Wharton's diary records the devastating effects of this pathologization of, of homosexuality. Um, this is a conversation that he had with his, with his friend um, Kenneth Williams, the star of the Carry On films, pictured here on holiday with Joe and um, Kenneth uh, Halliwell, well. thank you. Um, he notes that his friend, quote, talks a lot about a friend of his who committed suicide, found in a cottage she was, he said. They gave her the choice of jail or a medical home. Kenneth said that this man <coughs> went into the medical home and was given some kind of treatment to stop her thinking like a queen. The man apparently was very depressed. And after this, after this, and committed suicide, Kenneth then spoke of all the people he'd known who killed themselves. What the Butler saw suggests that psychiatry harms rather than heals. So picking up on the uh, issues that he's touching on in that diary entry, uh, the play um, lambasts the idea that psychiatry can cure homosexuals. And this idea that psychiatry does more harm than good was obviously a theme that must have had very strong and special resonance for homosexuals who were for being forced to undergo so-called treatments that actually amounted to forms of torture. The play centres, if you don't know it, on two psychiatrists and it follows the comic chaos invoked by their monstrous misconduct. The play opens with Dr. Prentice attempting to seduce a young woman called Ger Geraldine Barclay, whom he's interviewing for the position of secretary. When interrupted by uh, Dr. Rance, the government inspector, Prentice allows his colleague to think that Geraldine is a patient. <coughs> Geraldine is um, thoroughly abused by both Prentice and Rance. Rance threatens Geraldine with shock treatment. He has her committed. He sedates her, he cuts her hair, he forces her into a straitjacket. Um, Mrs. Rance tells him, your treatment seems designed to plunge the patient deeper into lunacy rather than achieving any lasting cure. And Dr. Prentice warns Rance as well that his treatment is of Geraldine is likely to drive her insane. Later, speaking metaphorically, Prentice remarks, <coughs> quote, the dangers of the cure may outweigh the disease. So there's a very clear message in the play about the harms caused by psychiatry and its attempts to cure people. The play is alert to the power of doctors, particularly their authority to define the norms of gender, sex and sexuality. In an attempt to hide his, uh, what he calls his seduction, Geraldine, from his wife, as well as from Dr. Rance, Prentice puts the young woman in men's clothes. When Geraldine, forgetting she's disguised as a man, refers to herself as a woman, uh, Rance tells her, take your trousers down, I'll tell you what sex you are, what sex you belong to. And he also threatens to have her put in a padded cell on the basis that, quote, rampant hermaphroditism must be discouraged. So he's maintaining the binary gender as part of his professional role. Rance describes homosexuality as normal intercourse, and Prentice describes homosexuality as an unnatural vice. However, these norms, articulated by the doctors, are cleverly subverted in the play through cross-dressing. 
Geraldine ends up swapping clothes with me, the page boy. Rance stresses the naturalness of heterosexuality when he asks Geraldine, who is actually Nick in disguise, quote, suppose I made an indecent suggestion to you. If you agreed, something might occur which, by and large, would be regarded as natural. If, on the other hand, I approached this child, and he smiles at Geraldine, but it's um, actually Nick, my uh, action would result only in a gross violation of the order of things. The heteronormativity that Rance enforces verbally in this scene is subverted visually. So cross-dressing is being very used very cleverly. The cross-dressing, of course, also suggests the fluidity and multiplicity of gender. Trying to explain the gender swap, Prentice says of Geraldine, um, he isn't a boy, he's a girl. And of Nick, dressed as Geraldine, she isn't a girl, she's a boy. So there is utter gender chaos in the play to much comic effect. And the gender chaos also blurs the boundaries of sexuality fulfilling Orton's desire, as he once said, to break down all the sexual compartments people have. The medical establishment is further undermined by presenting the doctors as immoral lunatics, driven by venal self-interest. Prentice lies to cover up his attempted seduction of Geraldine at the start of the play, allowing her to be committed as a patient in order to protect his professional reputation. Rance persistently manipulates and misinterprets information about Geraldine, to construct a sensational case study that will advance his career by producing for him what he thinks will be a best-selling book. As his name suggests, Rance is utterly rancid in his corruption, and he also rants, R-A-N-T-S, like a madman through the course of the play, so suggesting his own madness. As the play progresses, the two doctors seem far madder than their patients. Police Sergeant Match queries Rance's unusual behaviour, Geraldine and Nick agree that Prentice is a maniac, and Rance and Prentice end up threatening to certify each other insane. When Rance reveals that he's had his whole family committed, sent Freud a photograph of, quote, my foot placed squarely upon my father's head, and received, quote, a charming postcard in reply, the play is clearly lampooning Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, the man who popularised the view that homosexuality is a mental disorder. But another way in which what the Butler saw contests discourses of sexual deviance is by challenging the historical association of homosexuality and rape. The Wolfenden Report, published in 1967, which eventually led to the decriminalisation of homosexuality in 67, justified maintaining a higher penalty for buggery than any other homosexual act on the basis that, quote, it may sometimes approximate in the homosexual field to rape in the heterosexual and can cause, quote, serial, serious physical injury approximating to rape. So it's not a question of consent. Is they're saying rape is like, uh, hom uh, buggery or anal sex is like rape in their view. Cultural historians Susan Brown Miller and Joanna Ball, <coughs> who have both written feminist books on rape, the history of rape, they both um, confirm that in mid, in, by the mid 20th century in Britain, medical and legal discourse equated homosexuality with rape in terms of sexual deviance. According to Ball, rapists and homosexuals were placed in the same category of sex offender or as they were called, sexual psychopaths, united by the label of mental illness. So you can find books from the period on sex offenders that have a chapter on a rapist, followed by a chapter on the homosexual. Alan Dent's book on Joe Orton, Entertaining Hypocrites, published just last year in 2018, illustrates that the stereotype of the homosexual as a dangerous sexual predator remains powerful in contemporary society. According to Dent, this is all on the slide, creepy Kenneth Halliwell, the man Orton met at RADA and with whom he spent the rest of his life, coerced Joe Orton into homosexuality, forced him to share his bed, and bullied him sexually. All claims that are, in my opinion, based on prejudice rather than evidence. 
And what the butler saw, Orton contests the alignment of the homosexual with the rapist by highlighting the sexual abuse of women by men. When Prentice calls his um, seduction, what, what Prentice calls his <coughs> seduction of Geraldine is actually an attempted rape. It's rarely called that, but that's what it is. Prentice persuades Geraldine to disrobe on the pretext that he wishes to give her a checkup to confirm her physical fitness for the job. His intention to have sex with Geraldine is clear from his offer to let her, quote, test my new contraceptive device. And it's equally clear that Prentice's sexual advances are absolutely uninvited and unwelcome. Geraldine queries the need to remove her clothes. She asserts that she could not possibly allow a man to touch her unclothed and asks for a woman to be present during the examination. As his name indicates, Prentice attempts rape by pretense, a crime that had been recognised by the Sexual Offences Act of 1956, which criminalised for the first time the procurement of sex by deception. The later revelation that Prentice raped his wife on the eve of their wedding positions him as a serial sex offender. At the same time, the play suggests that his behaviour is typical rather than exceptional. As Prentice himself states, I'm a perfectly normal man. The play presents the sexual abuse of women as widespread and routine. Nick attempts to rape Mrs Prentice and behaves, quote, in an obscene manner with girls from the Priory Road School, and male police officers submit women to acts of indecency. Even Sir Winston Churchill, beloved national icon, appears guilty of rape when Geraldine's stepmother is violated by his parts, parts of a statue that are left embedded in her by the gas explosion. Match explains, Sergeant Match explains, that members of the local council, quote, decided in view of his war record to overlook Sir Winston's moral lapse and hope to see him reintegrated into society with the help of expert guidance. <coughs> Social anxieties about homosexual assault um, are invoked in the play, but only to be allayed. Although the, char or the characters um, think that Prentice has assaulted both Nick um, and, um, lovely image that captures that, I think, and Sergeant Match at different points in the play, it's clear to the audience that this notion arises from a comic misunderstanding. <coughs> Prentice doesn't assault either Nick or Match. For example, when Geraldine, disguised as Nick, accuses Prentice of sexual impropriety, the audience knows that she's a girl passing as a boy. So in this scene, cross-dressing very cleverly brings homosexuality into view, while simultaneously disputing the association of the homosexual with the rapist. Despite widespread fears about homosexuals preying on boys and young men, referenced frequently in the Wolf and Doom Report, <coughs> what the other source suggests that the threat of sexual predation stems far more often from heterosexual than homosexual men. <coughs> in the theme of rape, then, Orton is challenging the prevailing stereotype of the homosexual as a dangerous sexual deviant. The theme of rape also allows him <coughs> to challenge sexual double standards. As his diary makes clear, Orton liked boys of 15. This is what he says in his diary. Although he only has sex with boys of 15 um, in Morocco, pictured here with um, one of his regular boyfriends called Mohammed in Tangiers. And in Morocco, the heterosexual age of consent, there's no homosexual age of consent, because homosexuality is illegal in Morocco and in Britain, but the heterosexual age of consent is 15. Um, on seeing an attractive boy on, on the, at the seaside in Brighton days, days um, before the legalisation of homosexuality, Orton angry writes in his diary, this quote on the slide, I find lust an emotion indistinguishable from rage, or at any least anger predominates when I see something I can't have. I feel I may run mad one day and commit rape. The Sexual Offences Act which decriminalised homosexual acts <coughs> in private for men over 21, had received royal assent on the 27th of July, just two days before Orton makes this comment in his diary. He recognises then, I think this quote suggests, that that act made him, in the eyes of society, a rapist. What the butler 
Charles Saw, which Orton was writing on the very day the Sexual Offences Act was debated in Parliament, highlights the hypocrisy of a society that condones, even applauds men who have sex with underage girls, but condemns his relationships with teenage boys. So Nick, for example, behaves, quote, in an obscene manner with a group of schoolgirls from the station hotel. And though this is investigated by Sergeant Match, Prentice regards his progress with what he says, he, he regards it as enviable. So there's a sense that Prentice admires uh, Nick's behaviour. In contrast, when Prentice is mistakenly thought to be, quote, a man who mauls young boys, he agrees with rats that such behaviour would make him, quote, a pervert. So that's the critique of sexual double standards. The play also um, mocks stereotypes of um, heterosexual masculinity. Mrs. Prentice mocks her husband's manhood. She tells him that she's able to join a club for lesbians because you count as a woman. And she castigates his, inadequ his inadequacy as a lover, declaring, it's embarrassing. You must have learned your technique from a Christmas cracker. Prentice's rejuvenation pills suggest sexual dysfunction. Mrs. Prentice complains, you take them all the time during our lovemaking. The deafening sound of your chewing is the reason for my never having an orgasm. Using the absurdly mannered language that makes Orton's play so distinctive and so funny, Mrs. Prentice reveals that she's been faking orgasm with what I think is one of Orton's best lines. My uterine contractions have been bogus for some time. <laughs> Butler thus mercilessly mocks the definition of heterosexual masculinity that equates manhood with sexual dominance. Likewise, the play mocks marriage, challenging the popular image of the unhappy homosexual the large tumblers of whiskey that Mr. and Mrs. Prentice consistently swill throughout the play reflect their misery and attempts at self-medication leading to alcoholism. Their marriage is not only unhappy but unhealthy, it's deeply dysfunctional. Their relationship is characterised by violence. Um, Prentice threatens his wife, unless you're very careful, you'll find yourself in a suitcase awaiting collection. <laughs> I've never laughed at that line myself. I think it's absolutely chilling. Um, and there's sexual violence too. To prove that he's not a homosexual, Prentice, quote, seizes his wife, smacks her <coughs> face, and tears her dress from her. Subverting the prevailing definition of homosexuality as perversion, Mrs. Prentice is so sexually frustrated that she screams at her husband, and this is a line that does always make me laugh, unless you make love to me, I shall shoot you. Her husband's behaviour grows increasingly perverse across the play. At one point, Prentice declares, quote, a husband must be allowed to put his wife into a straitjacket. It's one of the few pleasures left in modern marriage. Homosexuals may be regarded as social misfits, but as Sergeant Match notes, quote, Marriage excuses no one the freak's roll call. By revealing deviance and perversity in marriage, Orton undermines the assumed superiority of heterosexuality. In addition, the theme of incest satirises the social anxiety that homosexuality poses a threat to the family. The revelation that the chambermaid raped by Prentice in the cupboard at the station hotel was the woman that he married the next day and the twins that she subsequently conceived and gave away are in fact Geraldine and Nick, means that he has attempted to rape his own daughter, and Nick has attempted to rape his own mother. The theme of incest links heterosexuality rather than homosexuality with immorality, and renders the reunion that defines the traditional happy ending deeply ironic. So to conclude, the relationship between Orton's sexuality is one, uh, his, the relationship between his sexuality and his work is one that has been discussed much by critics. Alan Sinfield proposes that writing prior to uh, Stonewall riots and the rise of the gay liberation movement after 1969, Orton fails to offer a positive representation of homosexuality, and his plays do not contribute to the assertion of a modern gay identity. So Sinfield is a bit disappointed in Orton. Uh, on the other hand, Alan Dent denies Orton's homosexuality altogether, 
arguing that he was not really gay, but a thwarted heterosexual. In this context, seeing homosexuality in what the Butler saw not only counters the historical invisibility of same-sex desire, but also rebuffs critics who position Orton as not gay enough or not gay at all. Thank you.
and she says to the bereaved, the cleaving, you've been a widower uh, for three days now. Um, have you considered a second marriage? <laughs> and, and another lovely line where he says, uh, she says, my husband died. My husband's died. I've had seven altogether. I'm extravagant, you see. <coughs> One a year on average since I was 16. And then I, oh, I love this line. And then I lived under stress near Penzance for some time. <laughs> Geraldine, in what but the soul? I lived in a normal family. I had no love for my father. Uh -huh. Joe had no formal, formal qualifications. There were four kids in the old family, and we all failed the 11 plus. We were not encouraged to think. Our thinking was disabled by parents who didn't place any importance on education. I'm just going to read you. Um, something from my book that I think illustrates my parents and also my schooling really. I mean it was it was pretty pretty dark. Uh, I asked my my parents if they would help me with um, spellings you know when you you're a kid, you, you get these spelling lists, and then you, you go home and you learn how to spell them. Well, you learn to spell them when I was a kid in the 40s by road. And so I'd sit over the spelling list and I'd try to get them right, but got upset when no one would test me. When I complained to my dad that no one helped me, he said, you think you're better than you are, Leona. You must learn to accept that you're not clever. Not surprisingly, I failed the 11 plus, and I went to a secondary model school. And people of my age know that if you went to a secondary model <coughs> school, you were excluded from any form of external exams. So I went to this school called the Mary Lee. Um, and on the first day I was there, I'm an 11 year old, and the headmistress stood on the stage that Monday morning in September 1955 and addressed the new intake of pupils by telling us the classes here are organised A to D. A being where the cleverest girls will be, and D is for the more doltish among you. At first, I thought doltish meant doll-like, as a, a young a, 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 a doll, and therefore the D stream girls were considered pretty and fragile. <laughs> I soon found out this was not the case. Uh, so I'll give you a sort of a, a feeling of what we, what we were sort of what I was doing you know, sort of in, 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 when I was 11. Um, in 1973, in a 1973 interview with John Law, his former teacher, a Miss Bish, said of Joe, he was semi-literate. He couldn't spell and he couldn't string a sentence together. <coughs> This is what she said. I can't believe he wrote those plays. Are you sure he wrote those plays? <laughs> I don't believe he did. He couldn't wait to leave home. And in 1951, he, was, he won a place at Rotherham, where he met Kenneth Hathaway. Kenneth was more educated than Joe, and was considered by his grammar school teachers to be potentially Oxbridge material. Joe and Kenneth eventually moved into a flat together where they worked together <coughs> for 14 years. Kenneth Halliwell played a tremendous part 
in Joe's education. Kenneth gave Joe the tools to think. They would read out loud to one another. And they'd read through classics like the Bible, Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and Bullfinch's myths of Greece and Rome. They wrote together, Joe practiced, learned by trial and error, learning his trade, so to speak. Eventually, culminating all his ideas into these wonderful, eloquent plays. One significant event proved to be a watershed in Joe's writing career. It came about when they were both sent to prison for six months for debating livelihoods. Up until this point, they had never been apart. They stole livelihoods from their local library in Islington. I remember being mesmerized by the wall in their it was covered from floor to ceiling with 2,000 plates that was ripped off, taken, cut out of art books. <coughs> it formed a huge collage over the back wall. The books they secreted out were, in their opinion, rubbishy books on subjects like etiquette. Uh, and in an interview, um, Joe says, uh, in, in 1965, um, the thing that put me in a rage about librarians was that when I went to, to quite a big library in Islington and asked for Gibbon's Decline and Fall, they told me they hadn't a copy of it. I was enraged that there, was, that there were so many rubbishy novels and rubbishy books. Libraries might as well not exist. They've got endless shelves of rubbish and hardly any space for good books. I do <coughs> things like pasting a picture of a female nude over a book of etiquette. Over the, pi over the picture of the author, I discovered that the Golan's books had blank yellow flaps. And I use this type, I use this to type false blurbs on the inside. My blurbs were mildly, mild, mild, sorry, mild, mildly obscene. Even at the trial, they said, they were mildly obscene. When I put the plastic cover back over the jacket, you couldn't tell that the blurbs weren't printed. I used to stand in the corner after I smuggled the books back into the library and watched people read them. It was very funny, <laughs> very interesting. So I thought I'd give you a taste of, of I mean, it is actually in, in the film, Pick Up Your Ears. But I thought I'd read it out for you. I liked it, it makes me laugh. So, um, so, in a, in a, in a Dorothy, in a Dorothy Sayers book on, a, on one, of his, one of her Lord Peter Whimsy who done it, he wrote on the blurb inside, when little Betty McDree says that she has been interfered with, her mother at first laughs. Um, it is only something that the kiddie has picked up off the television. But when sorting through the laundry, Mrs. McDree discovers that a new pair of knickers are missing. She thinks again. On being questioned, Betty bursts into tears. Mrs. McDree takes her to the local police station, and to everyone's surprise, the little girl identifies P.C. Brenda Coleridge as her attacker. Brenda, a new recruit, denies the charge. A search is made of the women's police barracks. What is found there is a seven-inch phallus, 
and a pair of knickers <coughs> of the kind used by Betty. All looks black for, P for kindly PC Coolidge. <coughs> what can she do? This is one of the most enthralling stories ever written by himself. <laughs> and it, it is the only one in which the murder weapon is concealed, not for reasons of fear, but for reasons of decency. <laughs> Read this behind closed doors and have a good shit while you're in <laughs> So that's, a, you know, one of the reasons they were prison. <laughs> the one I remember, um, I recall, is in the Daily Mirror in the headline, Gorilla in the Roses. Um,
charm and confidence. This gave him a streak of ruthless self-sufficiency. It made him strive to be a consummate artist, better than practically every other author we have looked after. In prison, he started to write his first play. It was adapted from a novel that Emma Kennedy had been working on, entitled The Boy Airs, which would, in due course, become the radio play The Ruffian on the Stairs. <coughs> what separated the now Joe King was that Joe had started to find his unique voice, which is something Kenneth didn't teach him, and that I maintain he never could have taught him. Joe's outrageous, detached sense of humour, I firmly believe, stems from our mother. She unwittingly had a huge impact on Joe. In my memoir, I have it in there. I explain how Joe was influenced by our mother, Elsie Orkin. To give you a sense of that, I'm going to read from the opening of my book. On Doctor's advice, a neighbour had moved my mother's bed downstairs into the front room. I'm not sure why it's called the front room. It's the only room downstairs, apart from the kitchen, the small square hallway. The family moved to this house in 1952. It's now 1966, and I'm 22. I sit on the end edge of her bed. She lies motionless, snoozing. Her thick, rimless glasses are perched on the end of her nose. The, the eider down is lifted into a pastry hummock by her distended stomach. And a packet of Keller's butterscotch is on the bed beside the pillow. Her wispy hair is now mostly grey. A few dark strands are the only sign of her once dark brown hair that she kept in place with a fine hand. The weak November sun shines across her bed, highlighting the liver spots and raised blue veins on her aging hands, which I think I've inherited. Her white false teeth sit like a freaky novelty toy on top of the cover of the weekly magazine. She has taken for 20 years the woman's own. She has always been careless with her teeth, often indiscriminately pulling them out and sitting down to eat. Rarely a day went by without her shouting, has anybody seen my teeth? <laughs> Only to find them at the bottom of a shopping bag or in a coat pocket. On one occasion, she joked how she left them in the lavatories at her local <coughs> pub, the Tiger, having taken them out to light a cigarette and forgetting to put them back in. It was only when her pal said, where's your teeth out? But she reclaimed them. Elsie looks much older than her 62 years. Now, I don't know how many of you know the play, Joe's play, Entertainment Mr. Slope. But there's a lot of comedy around the teeth, which I'm sure he must have got from his mother. So in, 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 this is what happened. In, in a cat, that cafe, in entertaining Mr. Sloan, Ed, Cat's brother, in the play says, look in the glass, lady. Let's enjoy a laugh. Flabby mouth, wrinkled neck, puffy hands, sagging tits, you fat. Put your teeth in, will you? Sitting there with a bean around. She stirs. My mother. She stirs and sees it's me. I've come to tell her that I'm expecting my first child. Before I can speak, she asks me to change her bed. 
I help her out to a chair. She catches her breath, stumbles, coughs, triple spit. I sort out a pair of clean sheets and get her back into bed. You make a bed just like the nurses do. You've turned out all right, considering I never wanted you. <laughs> Um, after I got him into bed, and I, I won't go through all this, but after I got him back into bed, um, she, she, she dozes off again, and then she says, she, and I lean over to, to my mother again to try to tell her my news. That, you know, I've got this child um, on the way. But she has another request. Make me a cup of tea, will you? <coughs> and pop me teeth into some. She rips the dentures off the front cover of the magazine where they are securely stuck and drops them, bits of print still attached, into the palm of my hand. <coughs> I peer down at them in revulsion, as if I was handling a dead rat. I go into the kitchen and slide the pink vermin into a chipped cup of diluted bleach on the lips. This cup has been on this sill, soaking these teeth for as long as I can remember. Joe, also clearly had an aversion to our mother's false teeth. He certainly found there was a lot of comedy to be had out of them. In entertaining Mr. Sloan, again, Kathy says, my teeth since you mentioned the subject, Mr. Sloan, are in the kitchen in surgery. I usually allow a good soak overnight. Now then, after our mother's funeral, Joe takes away his dentures. And in his diary, he says this I've taken my mother's false teeth down to the theatre. I said to Kenneth Clyburn, Here, <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Here, I thought you'd like the originals. He said, what? <coughs> Teeth, I said. Whose, he said. My mum's, I said. You look very sick. You see, I said. It's obvious that you're not thinking of the events of the play in terms of reality if a thing affects you like this. Simon Ward shut my jelly when I get them to eat. <laughs> so, teeth, you know, like and, and again in, in loot, and uh, the teeth that uh, uh, the player, he plays, uh, he plays them, the last play them were like castanets. So, Elsie could be outrageous and crude and cutting, she had no filters. Joe did have filters, but at times he refused to use them. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I want to read you this because although it's, it's a bit risky, but um, uh, this, it's a bit risky, but like Joe, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, we share the same rooms. Um, during the nineteen fifties, they, they, they had lots of they had lots of carnival games. The you know the, the everything was coming off of Russia and things like that. So um, our, um, there are many instance, instances when Elsie's behaviour was in indefensible. During the 1951 Festival of Britain, many local fates and celebrations were organised. <coughs> it was one of her nasty remarks that spoiled our day. The local pub, the City Arms, held Carnival Day. The Carnival Queen and her entourage came down that street. The Beauty Queen sat on a float surrounded by her attendants. She was waving to us all, throwing out handfuls of boiled sweets. And everyone was waving and smiling, 
but standing at her garden gate, Elsie Orton sneered as she looked at the local girl who had been chosen to be the beauty queen. And this is her remark. How on God's earth did a face like a diseased arsehole ever get to be crowned a beauty queen? She shouted. And this was heard by several onlookers and reported to the publican. And as a result, the family was banned from the carnival party held in the pub's garden. Now, now listen to this. Now, this is the one I think is a bit more controversial. But I'm... So that's Elsie's reaction. And then this is Joan. Joan and Kenneth are sitting with friends in a Tangiers bar. And there's a, an American couple next to them, on the next table. I sat, ne I sat next to a rather stuffy American Tory <coughs> and his disapproving wife. I don't know how he knew she was disapproving, but anyway. And this is what he says. He took, me, he took me right up the arse. I said, and afterwards, I said, and afterwards, he thanked me for giving him such a good bucket. They're the most polite people. <laughs> Nigel says quietly, those tourists can hear what you're saying. He looked alarmed. I meant them to hear what I said. They have no right to be occupying chairs reserved for decent sex purpose. <laughs> so, um, right, I think, I, 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 I just want to read you something now that I think really shows um, <coughs> So in, in my book, um, you can't get much more detached than this. Um, On December 29th, Joe arrived in Nesta for the funeral of uh, the, my mother's funeral. Anne's funeral. In his diary for that day, he records, I had a bit of quick sex in a derelict house with a labourer. I picked up. Later that afternoon, the six of us lined up at the door of the chapel of rest, where Mum's corpse was laid out. As we filed in to muted organ music, could be heard coming from concealed speakers. The room was dimly lit with heavy red velvet curtains enclosing a high window. Joan was intrigued by Mum's outfit. She was wearing a long white shift dress and a white satin quilted robe with gold lapels and cuffs held together by a thick gold cord complete with tassels. They made her face up, rouge on the cheeks, red lipstick and blue eyeshadow. <coughs> she would have loved all this elaborate stuff, I think to myself. I can see her now getting ready to go to a work's Christmas party. She'd borrowed a, she'd borrowed a, a gold lame dress, and her bulges were kept almost in place by her new pink boat corset. As she wrapped the corset around her body, She'd ask me to um, do up the top books. It's all safely gathered in, she said. <laughs> she asked, I replied, she couldn't afford, oh yeah, she couldn't afford to buy any gold shoes, so she painted a pair of black ones, court shoes, with gold jack black modeling paint. When the paint dried, the shoes were rigid, causing her to walk very stiffly. <laughs> During the evening, the gold paint began to crack and left a trail of gold dust as she walked. 
I said to Joe at, the funeral, at this funeral parlour, is it normal to dress the body up in this garish way? Jo, um, uh, in unison, we all said we did not. Mum would have loved a posh dressing gown, I said. Joe said he thought it was only for show and that they wouldn't bury her in it. Someone else would be shown <coughs> off in it next week. <laughs> he assured us. He assured us. Joe was bending over her. She doesn't look like Mum without her glasses. I agreed I'd never have known her without them. I noted that since living in London, he referred to Mum as Mum. She'd always been Mum to us. Joe touched her hand, commenting on how cold it was. Lifting it up, he asked if anybody wanted the cheap mark seat ring. No, she still had on, and they all declined. Walking round the other side of the coffin, he noticed a brown stain on the white head headrest. He tilted her head to one side to investigate further. What do you think this is, he said. None of us knew. Susan and Sharon, our nieces, squirmed and said, Oh, stop touching her. Jo thought it was seepage from her ear and said it was probably some sort of embalming fluid that, that now was leaking out. Oh, leave her alone, John. <coughs> it was John to us. Marilyn said, that's my sister. He recalled <coughs> the visit in his diary on the 29th of December. She looks fat, old and dead. As we trooped round the coffins, there was not a tear from any.